Hello, my name is Carolyn Helpin Healy. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Arts and Minds. I'd like to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking with you about Arts and Minds at home and the catalytic effect of COVID-19 on our work. I'll be talking to you about the biggest challenges we faced over the course of this year, how we responded, what we've learned, and our current thinking and new directions. I co-founded Arts and Minds in 2010 with Dr. Jamie Noble, a neurologist on the faculty of Columbia University Medical School. We decided to work together to improve quality of life for people with dementia and their caregivers through meaningful engagement with art. And we've partnered with art museums in New York City to make that happen. In the last 10 years, we've learned a lot, but this last year has been really startling in terms of our learning and the development of our organization. And of course, it's been a shocking and difficult year for many of us, all of us really around the world. So I share with you this timeline of the chronology of the museum shutdown and response. Um, both with regard to Arts and Minds and also with regard to other museums in the US. Last March 1st, that is March 1st, 2020, we had the first confirmed case of COVID in New York City. My co-founder, being not only a neurologist but also an epidemiologist, basically called me on March 6th and said, we have to cancel programs. Uh, that was a difficult thing to hear because the very reason we were established was to push back against isolation. So the thought of leaving our participants with dementia uh, in gr even greater isolation was extremely distressing. Nevertheless, it was very clear that because of their vulnerability and also because of the danger of this disease, that we absolutely needed to halt any in-person programming. Um, so I got my team together and one week later on March 13th, we were establishing our first Arts and Minds online program. That was the day that other museums in New York City closed for the first time. Over the course of April, May and June, there were many changes in the museums uh, and in, of course, in the wider culture. Um, with regard to museums, there were major changes in exhibition schedules. Museums were facing budget shortfalls. There were staff changes and many museums were making the shift to online programming, uh, effectively to join us where we had been working since May. The killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis happened on May 25th. And as many of you know, sparked demonstrations around the world. Here in New York City and among the Arts and Minds team, we were, we were feeling it. It was really rather devastating to my team, which is a very diverse team, um, and also to our participants, again, a diverse population. Um, and it was, had a large impact really on any justice-minded individuals. So that was our summer. Um, demonstrations in cities and towns across the country and around the world. By August, museums were beginning to reopen. That's when the Metropolitan Museum of Art reopened in New York City um, and other of our partner museums as well. However, now in March, 2021, Many museums around the country remain closed. The Smithsonian remains closed. The National Gallery of Art in Washington also remains closed. Um, and so these points of access for arts and minds type programs and any other programs for people with dementia and even for students are not happening in museum spaces. So we almost made it to the end of the year. We did get through the end of the year. We got through our presidential election, but then on January 6th, as you know, there was a major storming of the United States Capitol 
which was on some ways a rather, again, a rather destabilizing event. Um, and so we are still really working to kind of find our footing in this country. Um, and 2021 promises to be a year of museum innovation and hopefully political renovation. Um, though of course last week you may have heard we've um, suffered, uh, the Asian community has suffered a really despicable, apparently race-based killing of a number of people in Georgia. Um, so I put all of this out here just to emphasize the point that it's not merely the COVID-19 crisis, but that we're, we're living in a time of multiple crises that have impact um, not only on social justice, not only on health, but also on, uh, on, on finance and on global peace. So these, of course, are daunting challenges and our challenges at Arts and Minds are considerably different, um, but they occur against that backdrop. And when we initially closed down our programs last March, our main concern was to maintain communication with our participants. Um, that is a feature of our programs that uh, really has been the hallmark from the beginning. There's a real personal touch to our work, the way we reach out to people, the way we respond to them by telephone or by email, and certainly the way we greet them in person. So knowing that we were no longer going to be seeing them in person, uh, perhaps for many months, and what's now turned into a longer period even than that, we were very concerned about maintaining contact with them. And so we did that um, by telephone um, and by post and by email. As the executive director, I was very concerned about supporting the team of displaced museum workers. Uh, the people who teach for Arts and Minds are for the most part members of a kind of freelance community who share their talents with many museums around New York City. And though many museums uh, either furloughed them, in one case summar summarily dismissed many of them, um, and they were facing potential uh, dramatic unemployment or underemployment. Um, so it was very clear to me as the director that I needed to maintain the expertise of my team by supporting them and providing them work. And we needed to maintain the participants as well. So keep the people is what I was saying to myself and to my team. And if we were able to hold that together, we would be able to get through the crises and um, move into the future. So happily, we were able to work. We were able to keep many participants connected to us. Um, and then it was a challenge of prioritizing projects and finding new and efficient ways to work. We had only ever had a small office for a short time, but we were used to seeing one another in person in the museum spaces. So that had changed entirely. Um, and as all of you probably know by now, the work that's required to put one's programs online, to learn how to work Zoom, to learn how to communicate properly um, and efficiently with participants and the team members, this was a huge learning curve for us. So we had to prioritize uh, programming, programming um, exigencies and we had to reshape our communications. We also face the increased cost of online programming. The facilitation is a bit more expensive because we, we need a, a kind of a, a backup person to facilitate the tech while the uh, program, the teaching artist or the art historian is interacting with participants. So that's, a, that's already an additional cost. There was the cost of Zoom subscriptions um, and, we, and other technological features that um, we hadn't had as part of our budgets in the past. So we, we put all of this together, took the team, there you see them um, at the lower left, and we moved through crisis, um, though we stayed with anxiety for a certain period, um, went through a period of in introspection, and what came out of this 
was an innovative plan of programming that involved the invention of several new formats about which I'm going to tell you now. And we labeled this work Arts and Minds at Home or Arts and Minds in Casa. And we're now offering six programs a month in Spanish in addition to the approximately 14 programs a month that take place in English. So we're very proud of that. The first format was effectively our attempt to translate what we did in person in the museum space to the at-home environment and the Zoom technology. Um, and so this is a program of art dialogue and art making. It involves a dialogue of response and interpretation based on a chosen work of art that is then followed by a linked art activity that's sparked by a motivating question. So how are we gonna do this? And here you see one of our very early attempts. Um, that's my colleague Nelly Escalante. Before we even knew how to share the slideshow, we were holding up reprints on, uh, in front of the camera. And she's showing you there a work called La Mano Porarosa, uh, the powerful hand from the collection of El Museo del Barrio. Um, and she's discussing that with our participants. In the image at the lower right, you see Gloria and Marcella have gotten down to work um, in a meditation upon hands. And if you think back to March 2020, that was a time we were all very concerned uh, with hand washing and we were learning to be newly disciplined, um, maybe getting to know our hands in ways that we hadn't known them before as we were washing them for 20 seconds or more many times a day. we had requests for art conversation. Um, so this came from people who were not really interested in drawing or painting, but they did want to look closely. They wanted to exchange ideas about art. And so we formatted an hour long program that is only about art conversation. And instead of being focused on a single work of art, this program usually involves three or four works of art that are linked either thematically or as the work of a single artist or of a particular historical period. Um, and I love this photo of, of, of Alvaro and Tulia because we see Tulia looking really hard and focused looking, close looking together with others is really what's at the heart of this program. Arts en Minds en Español. Um, these same formats are offered in Spanish. Um, and so you see participants here uh, looking closely, laughing, engaged in conversation in their native language with uh, one of our facil facilitators and uh, a work of art. Again, I think this is from the collection of El Museo del Barrio. In response to the need to move with everyone staying at home so much, especially across the winter uh, in the Northeast of the United States where it's cold, where people were on lockdown, where it wasn't safe to go out anyway because of icy sidewalks and other kinds of difficulties, um, people had a need to move. Um, and so we devised a program on art and movement where people offer an embodied response to a work of art that's offered. Um, and you see there are participants raising their arms as the arms are raised in the figure on this vase, this water jar that's shown there on the screen at the left. We're now offering online self-care for the caregiver. This is something we've done intermittently in person. We've had caregiver, mostly caregiver training courses, but this is quite specifically self-care for the caregiver. It's our only program that does not explicitly include the person with dementia. And it's meant to be a space where the caregiver can carve out some time for him or herself to be together with others who are sharing similar caregiving challenges and to just take some time for meditation, for close looking at art and for drawing and mindfulness. And that's what you see here. And this is a program that I, I offer each month and I'm so happy to be able to do that. 
There's more. We've introduced artist studio visits, and these occur once a month in English and once in Spanish. And this is a kind of inside invitation to the working process of an artist. And so we're, we're, we're doing it in English, we're doing it in Spanish, and we're tapping, uh, teaching artists who have worked with Arts and Minds, we're tapping our friends, and we're, we're bringing people in touch with the art making process at the professional level. Um, and here I'm showing a close up detail of the work of uh, Posey Krakowski, who is a quilt artist. And you can see the amazing textures that she creates through her combination of materials and her, her stitched patterns that create perhaps unexpected textures. You're looking there at the, the wing of an angel on one of her recent pieces. a program that had just begun in person, we'd done it perhaps twice in 2019, is a really innovative partnership between Arts and Minds, the Jazz Museum in Harlem, and the Zuckerman Mind Brain Institute at Columbia University. This is a program where we bring music and art together with a scientist to understand how music and art work in the brain. And there you see a, a, a photograph of the amazing jazz artist, Helen Sung, who in each of these programs is in dialogue with the scientists. And she plays in response to the scientific theories. She interviews the scientists to try to tease out the ways in which our brain works um, to help us understand that. And I'm very proud that we're doing this um, in an inclusive way with people with dementia, um, because very often when the brain is spoken about, um, it's not spoken about in the presence of those who are living with cognitive impairment. And so we think that as part of our, as part of our mission to be an inclusive space, nothing is off limits. And we're talking in sensitive ways, in probing ways, um, and in interesting, compassionate ways to understand music, art, and science together with people who fall across the, the spectrum of cognitive function. And through all of this, we have learned a lot. And I, excuse me, I'll just go back a moment here. Um, we've been able to unite families globally and that's been so exciting. Here I show you the image of a family, um, uh, who, uh, it's, a, it's a family of Venezuelans who are split between New York and Venezuela and they can join the program together. They can come together at two o'clock in the afternoon for Arts and Minds en Casa, enjoy a visit with their elder parents and make art together and be together laughing with us at Arts and Minds. We've also learned, we've been so pleasantly surprised that older adult participants were able to transition to an online platform. And we were also amazingly surprised by how much warmth and human contact actually comes across the screen. Um, we, that was something that we had worried about. Um, of course, it's different. Um, we, you, you don't have all of the same physical cues, but we're learning to communicate in this way as well. So that's been very exciting. And in terms of the technology, um, our participants have, have been able to manage. Um, some of them entirely on their own um, and others because they have a care partner who can set them up with the iPad, the iPad or the, um, the desktop, whatever device they're working with. And, and here we see one of our participants uh, working at her kitchen table um, in conversation with Nelly Escalante, our arts and minds facilitator. We've learned to be more, I've learned personally as an executive director to really be uh, more intentional about the, the preservation of my team. Or, I mean, I think it's maybe more accurate to say, I've always been intentional, but it's more accurate to say that we have an amazing team of talented, diverse, compassionate educators. They need paying jobs. And Arts and Minds, as a not-for-profit organization, we may have our first 
responsibility to our participants, but the work doesn't get done without a highly qualified team. So I feel more and more somehow entitled to advocate for my team, um, to raise the funds that's necessary to offer our programs and to keep them employed. In terms of our current thinking and new directions, it's almost more a matter of remaining connected to things that have always been at the heart of arts and minds. Dementia is a social justice issue. We've learned this long ago. We have known this from the beginning. People with dementia and older adults in general are often marginalized and we exist to push back against that marginalization and to create an inclusive democratizing atmosphere that's all about shared joy of art. So that's a kind of reconfirmation against the backdrop of all the historical unrest this year. And, and again, uh, it, it, it's something that we are recommitted to. Our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, access and inclusion has to continue. We need to be including everyone in our programming, in our staffing, in our outreach efforts. If we're going to contribute to making the world a more dementia friendly place, this is one way we can do that by including everyone. And we are learning that online programming has increased access for people with dementia and their caregivers. People who may have been unable to attend museums in the past, whether because of geographic distance, physical disability, or other barriers, whatever they might be. Um, and so we recommit to continuing to offer programs online. And this will, will be an enduring part of Arts and Minds going forward. And here's a really lovely picture of the different ways in which people engage with Arts and Minds. Uh, across the screen. It even features one of our, one of our participants who's a professional photographer um, and there she is at the top center and with one of her, uh, a photograph of her husband seated on the couch, um, apparently conducting a symphony. And we know now that what started as an emergency response will become central to what we do at Arts and Minds. And we'll be maintaining online programs even after museums reopen and we can all safely gather together in person. We know now that that is not going to happen until early 2022. And so that sounds, that means we have a year we have another year to get better at this, to reach more people and to define our new direction. And it seems that defining this new direction and carrying out a new direction of arts and minds like programs or pro programs such as those that are offered by many museums and organizations around the world for people with dementia, those programs are often kind of done by small networks of people. Um, they happen in places because certain individuals are passionate about this work. And, but there isn't a really organized way in which this happens. And I know we're all, those of us in museum education who work with this population, those of us in dementia care, who understand the, 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 the potential of arts engagement to improve quality of life. We're all thinking about how we can make this happen for more people in more places when there's only just one of each of us. So Arts and Minds is planning to develop an online training course. And so that we can contribute to this vision of more programs in more places by training more individuals to be able to facilitate such programs. Um, and so right now it seems that online, online training may be the key to helping us establish more programs in more places, whether those programs themselves are carried out online or ultimately in person once museums reopen. But what we're all facing is an unmet need 
Not enough people around the world are finding access to such programs. There aren't enough programs in enough places to meet the need. So those of us who are on the side of expanding programming and working towards that need to be developing ways to maximize our reach. Um, and so I hope that we can work together with you and we can find ways to expand this work wherever it may be needed. Thanks so much for your attention today. And if you have any questions at all or wish to be in touch, please don't hesitate to contact me via email at chelpinhealy at artsandminds.org and take a look at our website to learn more, more about our programs, artsandminds.org. And you'll see there two short videos, one in English and one in Spanish, um, that sh will show you what an Arts and Minds program was like in person and will be like again. Thank you so much.